now that we're all here, welcome. I'm Sarah Cope from Kansas, Vermont's Chief Elections Officer. Uh, with me today are uh, Election Director Sean Sheehan, um, Deputy Secretary Lauren Hibbert, and representatives of the three major parties in Vermont. Uh, the purpose of today's statewide campus is to certify the results and winners for federal and statewide uh, officials from the Tuesday, November 5th general election. Before we dive into the canvas, I want to make some important recognitions. Uh, first and foremost, um, Vermont's town and city clerks have been working diligently for months to prepare for and to conduct this election. They are truly the backbone of good elections in Vermont, and they have been required to put in many extra hours and, um, and a lot of extra attention to details in order to ensure that this election went smoothly on top of their regular duties uh, as clerks. And so we should all thank our town or city clerk. Um, second recognition, uh, my elections team. Uh, this uh, small team has been working nights and weekends to make certain that the clerks have what they need in order to conduct uh, free, fair, and accessible elections. Um, they have been overseeing ballot creation, um, engineering a universal vote by mail election, and uh, frequent campaign finance filings over the past months. And this has kept this team moving at a sprint pace across a course that feels more like a marathon. So thank you to your team. Um, I also want to thank our civic and voter engagement uh, director. Uh, there, there's a whole team uh, led by Robin Palmer. Um, we were able to create Vermont's first universal voter guide for the 2024 general election. And this team has been out engaging voters, registering voters uh, for many months over the summer. And, um, and I think that the heavy participation that we saw in this election uh, has to have been aided by the work of our voter engagement team. Um, lastly, in the run-up to the 2024 election, we had great collaboration with Governor Scott and his team. Um, and in particular, I want to thank the Agency of Digital Services and BGS for their collaboration and for helping us to ensure a smooth and safe election. So our mission uh, as Secretary of State and our team is to, to provide a secure and accurate election. The canvassing process is a careful and deliberative process that is defined in statute. And what you will witness today is a result of that process. Um, as I said back in August, we needed to turn our focus to ensure that the general election would be able to be certified efficiently on time and with confidence. And I'm happy to say, as of 10 a.m. on November 12th, we are pleased with the results of that focus. I'm relieved that this is the last statewide election that we will be administering under our old election management system. Moreover, I'm really proud that our elections team, our technology partner, and our town and city clerks put in the extra work that was necessary uh, to iron out the wrinkles and make sure that the system worked on its last hurrah. Uh, immediately after our election, our team, in conjunction with clerks, diligently checked the accuracy of the election night results. Uh, this is the reason the certification period is seven days in statute. This is an important period of time uh, where uh, every vote is uh, checked, double checked, to make sure that we have cap that we have tabulated all the ba ballots and that the results are accurate. We will always prioritize accuracy over expediency. And so we thank you for your patience and the patience of uh, Vermonters as we conducted this deliberate process, ensuring accurate results uh, reflective of each and every ballot cast by Vermont voters. Today's canvas of federal and statewide results is an important part of the results certification process. As I said earlier, we're joined today by members of the three major parties. Together, we will review and certify vote totals and winners in statewide and federal races. Uh, vote totals before us are the summation of official return of votes submitted to our office by our town and city clerks. I am, I am as pleased with the technical administration of this election um, 
as I could possibly be, but I'm even prouder of the participation levels. And this is what participatory democracy should look like. Uh, in Vermont uh, this year, uh, Vermonters came out in record numbers. We had 522,600 Vermonters registered to vote as of election day this year. 372,885 Vermonters voted, uh, topping the total participation in 2020 for a new total participation record. Uh, this represents more than 71% of registered voters in Vermont. Uh, this proportion is second only to our 2020 um, percentage turnout. Nearly 64% of those who voted voted early using a ballot that was mailed to them by the universal vote by mail system. Uh, so this was more than 237,000 voters it was slightly lower than the proportion in 2020, which is understandable since we were in the middle of a global pandemic at that time. Um, after our review, uh, we'll sign off on the certification of the results and the winners as official. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Elections Director Sean Sheehan. Uh, before I begin the process, I wanted to say a few words about the, the election. Um, in short, the way Vermont's 2024 general election was conducted makes me proud to be, to be a Vermonter. I think it starts at the top. I want to thank Secretary Coco Hansis, uh, Deputy Secretary Hibbert, Chief of Staff Mills, how do you mean the cameras there? But <laughs> you're doing your team. So they provided leadership, foresight, support, and liaisons uh, to local, state, and federal partners. I want to thank my staff and the Elections Division uh, for their tireless work and steady hands this year. They pulled off a successful presidential primary back in March, down a couple staff members, including a director. Uh, they brought on new staff and inspired candidates, brought them up to speed over the spring. Um, new staff, including me. And then they worked with municipal clerks and other partners to run the statewide primary in August in the general election last week. Uh, as the secretary mentioned, they did all of this on old systems while simultaneously working to build new systems, which we're very excited to launch next year. I want to thank the secretary's uh, civic and communication staff, as well as all the voter registration uh, efforts, volunteers who conducted outreach, all the media uh, outlets for, for your voter education, record high registration, record high voter turnout. Uh, those things don't just happen on their, on their own. Uh, those records are a testament to all of the work producing voter guides, holding voter registration drives, uh, and reminding every Vermonter that their voice matters. I want to thank the town and city clerks across Vermont, um, all the boards of civil authority and election workers. Their teamwork and dedication is admirable. Their commitment to a fair and accessible and accurate election is something we should all be thankful for. Um, elections are just one of many duties clerks serve in our towns, and oftentimes they're, they're, they're part-time, paid for just a handful of hours per week. Uh, and this year, they didn't just have to hone their expertise on election procedures, they also had to take crash courses in cybersecurity and physical security um, to prepare for, for, this, for this year's election and, and threats that we haven't faced in the past. Um, on that note, as the Secretary said, I want to thank the administration for their collaboration to ensure Election Day would not be derailed um, from the Agency of Digital Services uh, to, uh, to, to BGS, to Vermont Energy Management, Vermont State Police, um, to Governor Scott, uh, who joined Secretary Copenhansis uh, the week before the election for press availability, for many of you were there, uh, both urging Vermonters to partake in our participatory democracy and to do so in a peaceful and respectful manner. I mean, I want to thank the public I think Vermont voters really heeded that call. Um, after hearing a smatter of vitriolic anecdotes in the weeks leading up to the election uh, from, from clerks, from, from election workers, election day itself went largely smoothly uh, and, and respectfully. We heard that voters who forgot to BYOB, bring their own ballot, um, understood that they had to sign an affidavit to get another ballot uh, and willingly did so. We heard that voters were appreciative of their neighbors who volunteer their time to protect our democratic traditions. And in fact, down in Weston, we heard from the clerk that there was one voter who brought in a bouquet of roses to give to election workers as their, as their thanks. 
Um, that really, really warmed our hearts to, to hear that. Um, and finally, I want to thank election observers, both domestic and international. Um, we hear that domestic observers largely conducted their observations respectfully. They didn't interfere with the privacy of, of voters, and they didn't interfere with the, the work of election officials. Um, on the international side, I think most of the folks uh, in this room, with the parties, with the press, the others met or heard from, from Robert and, and Marie, it's the first press conference we've had in a while, they haven't, haven't been here. Uh, they were our uh, two observers from the Organization of Security and Cooperation of, of Europe. And they were just two of the 164 person mission representing 25 European states that fanned out across our nation for several weeks. Um, their preliminary report released last Wednesday sounded several alarms regarding the state of democracy in the United States, from disinformation to the role of PACs, but it also hailed the actual administration of elections, of this election, saying, quote, the 5th of November general elections demonstrated the resilience of the country's democratic institutions with a well-rounded process in a highly polarized environment, candidates campaigning freely across the country, and voters engaging actively. So yes, we have room for improvement, and we also have a strong foundation on which to build. And that foundation is thanks to our clerks, our other civil servants, our press corps and every Vermonter who reaches out to their neighbors, uh, their friends, their family, to encourage them to engage in our participatory democracy. So I'll now go over today's process. Uh, questions are welcome from the committee. I do ask that the press and public hold on questions until we're done with the, the certification process. Um, so as we canvass the votes here for national and statewide, the rest of the races are being canvassed across the state. Um, House reps, there's a rep clerk and one other election official who are processing the, the canvas. Uh, for Senate, there's a senatorial clerk and chairs of county parties invited to, to those county canvases along, along with the, the county role, the, um, the high bailiff role this, this year. Uh, the election night reporting and the official return of votes um, were sent to us and to other canvassing committees. Those votes were then tallied directly from town's official return of votes and write-ins recorded and results presented to the committee, as, as we were going to do. The candidate with the most votes has a check mark next to their name. In most instances, the check mark signifies the winner of the race. Um, the one exception to that this year is the lieutenant governor race, because no candidate received 50% of the vote. The legislature will hold a vote uh, when they convene in January. What we're tasked to do uh, per 17 BSA 2592A is for all state and national offices, uh, statewide public questions, the Secretary of State and the Chair of the State Committee of each major political party or their designee uh, shall constitute a canvassing committee to receive and tally returns and issue certificates. For the U.S. Senator, representative to Congress, and statewide offices, uh, per 2592H1, the canvassing committee shall declare the person receiving the largest number of votes for each office to be elected, and it shall issue a certificate of election signed by a majority of the canvassing committee. The committee shall send or deliver the certificate to the candidate elected. However, there's no certificate for the statewide office, as those are canvassed by the, the Joint Assembly uh, in, in January. Per 2592K, in the case of the offices of governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer, secretary of state, attorney general, and auditor of accounts, the canvassing committee shall prepare a certificate of election, but shall not sign it. The prepared certificate shall be presented to the official canvassing committee appointed by the General Assembly, pursuant to chapter two, section 47 of the Vermont Constitution for their use if they desire. So for the US Senator, and representative to Congress, we will sign the report and sign the certificate of election for the winning candidate. For the statewide offices, we will sign the report. And I also have here the unsigned certificates, which we will deliver to the Joint Canvassing Committee to use, again, if they desire. I have three sets of documents here as well, the statewide canvas, a summary of pages for, for each, of, each of you. Here for the press, you can distribute after as well. 
We also have the turnout report, um, which is uh, broken down by county and, and statewide. Uh, we have canvas reports and certificate selection for each race uh, as I mentioned, for the presidential electors, members of Congress to sign certificates, the rest of the review. With that, I will proceed to read the vote totals for each candidate and each race before asking the committee to review and sign the reports and certificates. For the report, the official report for the Canvas Committee for U.S. President and Vice President, Kamala D. Harris and Tim Walsh, the Democratic Party, received 235,791 votes. Donald J. Trump and J.D. Vance, the Republican Party, 119,395 votes. With the We the People Party, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Nicole Shanahan, 5,905 votes. For the Libertarian Party, Chase Oliver and Mike Kermat, 1,828 votes. With the Socialism and Liberation Party, Claudia de la Cruz and Karina Garcia, 1,710 votes. The Peace and Justice Party, Cornell West and Melina Abdullah, 1,549 votes. The Socialist Worker Party, Rochelle Fruit and Dennis Richter, 211 votes. For U.S. Senator, um, Independent Bernie Sanders, 229,429 votes. For the Republican Party, Gerald Malloy, 116,512 votes. Independent Steve Berry, 7,941 votes. Libertarian Matt Hill, 4,530. Peace and Justice Party, Justin Sokol, 3,339. Epic Party, Mark Stewart Greenstein, 1,104 votes, with the winner being Bernie Sanders. For Representative Congress, Democratic Party, Becca Bell, 218,398. Republican and Libertarian, Mark Coaster, 104,451. Independent, Adam Ortiz, 19,286. Peace and Justice Party, Jill Jesse Diamondstone, 7,552. The winner being Becca The report for governor uh, Republican Phil Scott, 266,439. <laughs> Democratic Progressive Esther Charleston, 79,217. Independent Kevin Hoyt, 9,368. Peace and Justice June Goodman, 4,512. Independent Eli Poa Motino, 2,414. The winner, uh, Phil Scott. And this one, we only signed the top sheet. 
Lieutenant Governor of Republican John S. Rogers, 171,853. Progressive and Democrat David Zuckerman, 165,868. 165, Peace and Justice, Ian Diamondstone, 13,671. And with this, you'll see there's the check mark uh, signifying that, uh, that John Rogers received the most votes. And as we noted, uh, it will be the election of the joint committee. And that's also noted on this. And we decided how long that is. For state treasurer, Democrat Mike Pichak, 211,000. 134. The Republican Josh Beckhofer, 135,763. Mike Pichet, anybody here? We'll sign the top sheet. For Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Hansen, Democrat, 205,378. Republican H. Brooke Page, 138,673. Uh, the winner, Secretary Copeland. Broader River House, uh, Democrat Aggressive Doug Hoffer, 207,195. Republican H. Brooke Page, 134,066. The winner, Doug Hopper, who's on the top sheet. Uh, and finally, for Attorney General, uh, Democrat Charity R. Clark, 200,711. Republican Turner Nelson, 128,798. And Peace and Justice, Kevin Gustafson, 17,159. Uh, with the winner, uh, Charity Clark. And we'll sign the top sheet. So it's our process here. I'll, I'll know again you have to turn out. Um, report on the results. Happy to share with the press and public that's here. We have uh, one one copy of the uh, of the full canvassing committee report or breakout by accounts. As you can see, it's very thick. Um, that will be posted on our website later today, along with the uh, canvassing results from around the state as they're sent in to us. With that, this concludes the, the canvassing committee. So I just want to take a few moments uh, to thank you all. Um, thank you for participating in this certification today, but more importantly, thank you all for the work that you did over the previous uh, many months to engage with voters, to connect candidates with voters, um, and to strengthen our democratic process uh, by ensuring that every voter has the opportunity to understand which candidate they think would do the best job. Uh, in order to maintain a vibrant democracy, we all have to work hard to ensure that voters have the information they need to make the right choice of who to support on their ballot. And I'm really proud of the interest and enthusiasm uh, that voters and candidates uh, had during this election. Uh, the story of the 2024 election is record turnout. And in a democracy, that's the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, do you have to? Do you want to take questions from the people, or do you guys want to stand and do what works best for you? Do you want everyone for the questions? Um, yeah. Um,
What, what, I'm good at either one. Sure. I mean, I mean, I don't see why not. So Jim, why don't you sit back down? I don't care. I'm going to have a whole thing all the time about fan out kind of things. Partners, they wanted to err on the side of, 
of, of hearing any, anything that, that could, could escalate. Uh, there weren't, I'd say, explicit threats, but there were certainly implicit threats and a lot of animated and uh, anger at the part of the court. So, and, you know, in a few instances, not, not as much as the rest of the country, and not on election day. Would you say there were more instances than in previous years, or is it hard to that's my that's my understanding. I think in, in Vermont we typically I mean, these are our neighbors, right? We we know we know our town clerks, we know our election workers, the people that live next to us. Um, we know that they uh, they're, they're volunteering their time to to, uh, to make sure we have a fair and accessible process. Um, and I think in in past years Vermont itself I felt uh, like we're immune to what goes on the rest of the rest of the country. Um, and I think we're we're seeing some that you know, nowhere is immune to everything uh, going on. So we can't um, can prevent, but but fortunately, um, you know, I think more more volunteers came um, came together to help still make this, this special place and the type of community fabric that we. The legislature this year passed just limiting firearms before the places everywhere. Maybe it's for Sean as well about the results that were reported by an Associated Press versus what was on your website. I understand the Secretary of State's website um, reports blank votes, um, and that there's two categories of you know votes, but also votes that were worth blank. Um, can you maybe shed some light as to why, like that discrepancy between the AP and between the website? Um, I can't speak to all the AP's process, but I do know that they have reporters and, and stringers out in many uh, towns, in many polling locations, so they get the uh, summary sheet or, or the results often from uh, from local, local election officials report on that. The process, as we have, is that the uh, clerks can, you know, if they're a tabulator town, which are towns that uh, have a thousand uh, kilometers more um, required to use a tabulator for, for state state law. They have fewer than a thousand uh, residents. They can, can use um, they can hand count if they if they wish. So the towns that use tabulators, you know, that they get the um, they get the tabulator tape with the with the results saying the total number of votes cast. The, the right end votes, but not, they don't have, it's a manual process then to see who the right ends are for. Uh, my understanding is the AP, if they're there, the reporters, I mean, this public uh, can can see the tabular tape and report on information from it. The clerk and the election officials then enter uh, that information from their summary into our uh, election management system. Those results as they're entered by uh, by clerks are the unofficial results that are posted on election night. So that happens anywhere from, I don't know, 7 to 10, a few minutes after 7 o'clock when the polls close up until I think it was about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the, in the morning when the, when the final uh, of our 247 town and, and city clerks were entered. Um, the results, again, the, the hand count towns take, take longer for that, that part of the, the process. Then over the following two days uh, until 7 p.m. on Thursday, the clerks and boards of civil authority uh, have that time to go through who the write-ins are for. And that's a process of uh, first assessing, or breaking down all who was written in, which one then looking and having the board of civil authority see if a name is slightly different with the voter intent to be the same person, you know, merging those names as appropriate. They sometimes people write in candidates even if their name is on the ballot. That might be a reason why uh, a named candidate might get a few more votes than uh, the official return votes than they did on, on election night if they were also written in in addition to having people voted for them in, in other ballots. Uh, for the blank, as we have on here, that's some people didn't didn't vote in that particular race, they would be uh, be blank in that um, 
in that category. If they voted for, for more than more than one, it would be it would be an over overvote. So all those numbers go through the, uh, you know, the, the election officials check all that information and uh, you know, and, and finalize it for the official return of votes, which come to this process here today. Um, as far as everything that the AP does beyond that, I think that would be a question for them. How would a, a potential uh, revote in Bennington County, I believe, uh, if they move forward with that, how would that change this? I mean, number one, I guess, can you just maybe talk about why you're recommending a revote in Bennington County and how process wise it would play into this? Yeah. Um, so, the, as we said at the beginning of uh, the presentation today, the results for local elections are certified um, by that district clerk. Um, in the case of an election that is contested and, uh, and a recount is asked for, um, then the court would decide what the, what the procedure is going forward. Um, what we noticed about the error that was made back in 2022 in the Bennington One House District is that the number of voters who, um, who were mistakenly put in the wrong district uh, was greater than the vote differential between the two candidates. And so that's why our office is recommending a revote of the Bennington One House race only. Uh, there were no other elections in on either of those ballots uh, that would have been close enough that those voters um, being placed in the wrong district uh, could have made uh, a difference. Um, and so we expect that that challenge will be brought today um, and, uh, and we will be uh, recommending to the court that they order a revote in that race. That revote would be a universal vote by mail um, conducted election because general elections in Vermont are conducted by universal vote by mail. And as such, uh, it would need to have ample time to uh, create the ballots, mail the ballots, and have the ballots returned. And so we don't know at this time uh, exactly when uh, the due date or the end date of that election would be. Um, but when we get some directive from the court, we will uh, be able to put a little more clarity on that. Any other questions? I mean, I guess I just have one more, sorry. Just, maybe it's just for anybody at the table, town secretary or any of the department chairs too. Um, you know, how, how, is, how does election go? I mean, just in terms of, you know, we, we broke records by about a thousand in terms of voter turnout. We've not had mail out ballots for a few years. I guess just what is your assessment of, of, you know, number one, the fact that we had such a high turnout election this year, but number two, just how is the system working more generally? How are your parties processing it? I mean, on election day, we're already like 150,000 people to vote in three, two hundred Right. So just maybe your yeah. kind of thoughts on what you're yeah. I, I mean, I will speak on behalf of the Democrats here. I'm really grateful for the way that elections are run in Vermont. Um, you know, the secretary prioritizes transparency, prioritizes efficiency. Um, we trust the secretary and the clerks that we're going to get uh, a free and open election and that we're going to get uh, accurate results reported in a timely fashion, and we've seen that. Uh, on top of that, the secretary has implemented some changes. Um, we have the, the voter guide, which is really great. Uh, it's really helpful for having an informed voting public. Um, and there are some additional changes to the infrastructure around the way that elections are conducted that are going to make it easier and more transparent for Vermonters to understand exactly what's going on in the process. So I think uh, overall, very happy with the way that this election was conducted. So yeah, I would, I would add to that. I agree with everything Director Daniel said. I think the current system with universal mail and voting, really great. Um, that should continue to happen. Uh, you know, I think for the Progressive Party, you know, two of the big major reforms that I think this election highlighted more than ever is the need for ranked choice voting, which, you know, we've been advocating for since our party's existence, um, saw some traction in the legislature last session. We shouldn't, especially for statewide and also local uh, statewide races, we shouldn't be pumping um, decisions to the legislature when you don't have a majority support for any candidate. Um, we should just 
through our ballot, get to a majority support um, through a registered voting process. Um, and then also, you know, public, this election has made more clear than ever the need for public financing of elections, and we do have something on the books in Vermont, but it hasn't been used um, in a long, long time because it's not uh, an effective system that people want to use. And we saw a massive amount of money being thrown into our Vermont election system by very, very wealthy people um, in both the primary and the general election. This, this has been heavily reported upon. Um, and the only shot um, for the people really have uh, running for office and having their voice heard um, is through a public financing system where you, you can kind of level the playing field a little bit. So uh, my name is Deb Villadu. I'm the former state chair of the Republican Party. I'm here on behalf of Paul Dane, our current state chair. Um, I would just like to add that uh, this was a great election. Thank you for all of your work. Uh, I did work the polls that day, and it was phenomenal. It was smooth, well-organized. Kudos to um, uh, Susan Hill, our town chair, or our city clerk in Essex Junction, so I was really proud of that. We're also uh, extremely thrilled about the outcome of this election. It was historical. Uh, I think it brings the state of Vermont closer to a balance under the Golden Dome, if you will. And uh, we couldn't be more thrilled. And we look forward to 2026. Thank you. So I, you know, I talked a little bit before about, um, about the great work of our uh, civic and voter engagement team uh, at the Secretary of State's office, who were out um, tabling at festivals and farmers markets and uh, concerts and, and ball games all summer and fall. Um, engaging with voters, making sure that they understood how to get registered to vote, how to update their voter registration information, uh, but most importantly, how to access their voter guide. Um, and the number of people who, uh, who just went out of their way to say thank you for the access to information that that voter guide provided um, was really heartening. Uh, I think that it's really easy even in a teeny tiny state like Vermont, it's really easy for ordinary people to feel disconnected from the people who represent them uh, and to feel like they don't know how to make their voice heard, don't know how to contact that candidate and ask them a question. And uh, providing a voter guide that connects voters with the candidates, including their website, their social media handle, and their contact information is really critical to voters feeling empowered and, and feeling uh, able to make an informed decision of who they're going to vote for on election day. So I'm really thankful to our uh, engagement team uh, for the great work on that. Additionally, I want to point out um, that we did make uh, a significant change in terms of transparency with respect to campaign finance this year. Um, many, many times over the decades that I have been involved in the political process in Vermont, um, you know, I've heard people say it's just too hard to figure out who is a candidate and who has filed and whether they've been filing on time and what they filed and how to get that information. Um, and I want to thank Director Sheehan for, uh, for doing a lot of the legwork to make sure that we could compile a list after each campaign finance filing of candidates uh, who have not filed uh, versus candidates who have filed. Um, we know that Vermont's campaign finance law has some limitations in terms of ensuring transparency. Uh, we will be making recommendations to the legislature that will help us improve transparency in future elections. But it was really important to me here in 2024 in the first election that I oversaw to make sure that we were doing everything that we could to facilitate that transparency and that understanding so that Vermonters can see who are funding the elections uh, that, that are being run in Vermont. Uh, so we look forward to working with the legislature in the coming session to, uh, to create even better transparency, um, but really thankful to the team for doing the legwork to make sure uh, we could provide everything that we could this year. I think so. I mean, 13,000 people voted for the Socialist Party candidate. I can't imagine that most of those folks would be voting for the Republican 
as their number two, right? Um, it's green out peace and justice party. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, when you see a result like that, you know, it only would have taken about half of those votes moving forward. Um, I mean, we have no way of knowing, but you know, that's why it's really important that we actually move my choice going forward because I think Vermont deserves that kind of know where the true majority um, opinion lies with, with the voters after the election. Do you think the legislature can certify the election for suffermen then? No. Yeah. I think that's not the system that we have. I think the system we should have is ranked choice voting with majority votes. So you think that the correct thing would be for them to cast their votes for? Yes. Gosh. Thank you. Any final questions? Wonderful. Thank you all for coming today.